They are all big compared to the holy books of other religions like Christianity or Islam. But it's difficult to compare them because they are measured differently, uh, the, uh, even within their own cultures and traditions. The Thais like to measure the Pali Canon in 45 volumes. Of course, those volumes are not identical in size. Chinese canon is a very difficult term because there have been Chinese tripiticas produced uh, since the Tang period and they all have different sizes. And the one used today mainly produced in Japan in the Taisho era, the, China, the Taisho tripitica has well over a hundred volumes. And the Tibetan canon is usually uh, uh, made into t traditional Tibetan volumes of 100 to 108. So they are all big, diverse, but uh, difficult to compare them without making an equation of imaginary Western pages or something like that. Well, they were produced at different times with different imperatives of the monastic uh, cultures that reflected on what they needed at the time and pr produced what we can call a canon, if you like. Uh, so the Pali canon is an early collection done even perhaps in an oral period. And at that time, the tantras and other such texts were not uh, available, maybe not pronounced, or maybe not uh, compiled. And so the other, as collections, the others are much, much later and a much more diverse uh, body, more diverse bodies of literature had evolved at that time. And then within Tibet itself, there, and in, in China too, I believe there would be debates as to what to include as the authentic word of the Buddha, because all of them define themselves as containing the authentic word of the Buddha or disciples. There are different definitions of authenticity, but that is still the basic rule. So for the Tibetans, for example, they would only include texts that they believed had an Indian original, that was translated and therefore was authentic. Uh, Chinese also had, had, a, had a similar principle. We have old Chinese catalogs which discuss these questions and sometimes a later cataloger will reject works that were accepted earlier on and say, there, this, this is not an Indian compilation. So the main idea was it should be an authentic work of the Buddha and it should go back to India if it was in translation. But the decisions were made at different times, different places, so all, none of them were fixed, really. Even the Pali Canon has some uh, flexibility in it, and particularly the Tibetan and the Chinese evolved over centuries with debates, rejections of texts, uh, taking in new texts, and so on. So they're all evolving, changing. We can't, that's one of the reasons the word Canon is a little difficult, because the Canon itself is an ev evolving idea. Almost all, um, they must mostly have had uh, Sanskrit originals, but um, some of them were translated from other languages. Um, in fact, the, um, some of the Tibetan translations were made from Chinese because the scholars knew that there had been an original text in Sanskrit which now no longer exists, which th then no longer existed and so they had to translate it from Chinese. Um, other uh, texts were translated from other languages of the area, from Cotonese, uh, Sogdian, and um, some other languages. And in fact, at one point, one of the reasons that are given for the revisions that happened um, later on in the translation period that divides the, the uh, uh, early from the late translation period is the um, problem that there was such a plethora of texts, some of them translated from different source languages, that it was really quite difficult 
for people to know what was really uh, authentic and valid and what wasn't. And they were translated, because they were from different sources, they varied quite a lot. The Tibetan that resulted varied quite a lot and they needed to be made more uniform. But by and large, yes, they were to a very large extent translated from, um, from Sanskrit originals. Well, the wider picture we don't really know. Some people say, you know, there were a lot of social changes going on in India at the time. But the most obvious uh, answer to that question is the arrival of the uh, invaders, Muslim invaders from the Northwest, who began to um, spread through uh, Northwest and later Northeast India. Of course, they didn't. Um, the reason they hadn't been able to invade before was due to the strength of the uh, various kingdoms and republics that existed in northern India at the time. So you could say that they wouldn't have been there if there hadn't been a, a considerable weakening of the defenses that uh, had enabled the Buddhist cultures to flourish in those areas. But the immediate cause of uh, the disappearance of Buddhist culture was um, probably the arrival of the um, invading armies and they were extremely destructive and there was one um, it had actually been happening for several decades but there was one particularly bad year which was 1193 I believe when um, a particularly strong and uh, violent army swept through the area and destroyed um, the not for the first time but destroyed pretty much definitively uh, the universities of Nalanda and Vikramashila and probably others too. And um, there are some accounts of the destruction of the great libraries and the burning of the books. And so, um, you know, this was a, a very big change. But um, uh, I doubt if even an invading army would have been able to wipe out Buddhism as a culture if there hadn't been many other causes at work. And um, uh, I think we have to assume as well that uh, was, there must have been movements within India um, that by which the, um, the various different uh, Hindu, indigenous Indian beliefs began to uh, encroach in people's minds and in the way people practiced and in their cultures um, on the um, uh, quite extraordinary spread of the practice of Buddhism, study, it's studied by monks in the monasteries and the influence that it had on, um, on the uh, ordinary life of, of people in, over large areas of India. So it's quite a complex story. Well, we don't know the answer to that question. So much of the Sanskrit is simply no longer found. Um, it's said that uh, probably somewhere between 10, 15, maybe as much as 20% of the uh, texts of the Kanjur have Sanskrit texts surviving, but the rest don't, so that's a large proportion, 80-85%. And um, those texts, very interesting to know what might have happened to them, but uh, for the moment they simply haven't turned up. A lot of texts were found in in, uh, among the Newars of the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal, which had been relatively stable politically for a very long time. It was never invaded um, and um, didn't change very much. And then more recently, uh, Sanskrit texts have been found along the uh, Silk Road and in areas much further north, the archaeological finds where the conditions for preservation are much better than they were in low-lying India with its humidity and uh, insects and, and so on. Um, so um, uh, we can only guess, but between the two, um, spanning quite a large period, first of all the Chinese translations, which you know the translators were took great pains to find most of the texts that were really being used at the time and which existed and take them back to China and translate them. And then later on, the same happened for the Tibetans. So covering a really very large 
span of time, almost a thousand years, um, it's unlikely that there were many, many texts that completely disappeared, but that's sheer conjecture. We have what we have, and um, some, um, some texts, I believe, have turned up in Sanskrit, not very many, but f a few and some fragments of scriptures which don't seem to exist either in Chinese or Tibetan, so there may be, there may be a few. And then, of course, the, the, other, the, other, the other consideration is the different versions of texts which, which tended to evolve over time and geographically in different areas. And so um, we don't necessarily have records in the Chinese and the Tibetan of all the versions of all the texts as they, as they evolved. I think there are many ways to interpret the value. So for some people it might be a matter of inspiration. Reading the life of the Buddha in different versions could be a matter of inspiration for people, a matter of uh, revealing the life of the Buddha, say, in relation to places like uh, Bodh Gaya here. Another uh, senses it can deepen a person's understanding of practices like as for example uh, meditation, meditation on the breath, on napana. We can compare various versions in Pali, in Tibetan, in Sanskrit, in Chinese translation and here in fact we see that they are very close to each other and we could perhaps come to the conclusion that this is one of the core practices of meditation of Buddhism. So we can see the both the kind of synchronic and diachronic relation of, of texts which gives a, a deepening idea of the teachings or practices. So I think there are multiple benefits to that and I don't think there, I can't really think of any drawbacks. I think it's beneficial to expand one's knowledge. It might increase tolerance too amongst Buddhist groups if they see that, oh, we're all, we all have these core, we have some core traditions because sometimes people, because they don't know the languages and don't read the shared texts, sometimes they have an idea that people who are from the Pali tradition might think, oh, this Tibetan is something completely different. It has only tantras, which we don't have. Or the Tibetans might think similarly that the Pali tradition is not is different and so on. So it has many benefits in many ways, I would think. Sporadic translations of Buddhist texts from any of these collections began in the 19th century. Uh, I don't think in the 18th, but I might be wrong. That was when the study of Indian texts, Sanskrit, and others began in, in Europe, but I'm not sure if there are any real translations. The first description of the Tibetan canon was by a great Hungarian scholar, Alexander Kshoma de Kurosh, published in the 1820s and 30s, and he did translate a few things. And as for the Pali, I think the first translations from Pali, excluding well, French, which might have come earlier, were in the mid 19th century on, and the idea of translating the entire Pali collection began in the late 19th century with the foundation of the Pali Text Society in England, and they have more or less translated the whole uh, collection. But that's done by separate translators, sort of at different times over a long period, but they do they did have the idea of a, of, of a single project. And then for the Chinese, it was uh, much later, the BDK, Tripitaka, which is in progress. And for the Tibetan, the idea of a systematic uh, translation has recently begun with a 84,000 project. I think the benefit for Buddhists should be fairly obvious. Uh, they can read texts for inspiration, they can learn actually about Buddhism. And by the very fact that so many of these texts have not been translated, even when Sanskrit exists,
or even when they have Chinese translation that has not been been made, uh, there are I'm sorry, tr Chinese translations exist, but they've not been translated into English. So people who know only English or European languages, if they are Buddhist, they don't even have access to their full canon or tradition of texts. So it will help a great deal in being aware of the of the practice, philosophy, history, uh, narratives. There are so many wonderful things in these canons or in the Tibetan canon. So people will be able to be aware of their own tradition. And for non-Buddhists, more or less the same thing. That if we talk about Buddhist, how can we talk about Buddhist philosophy in, in comparison with Western philosophy when most of the texts are not translated? So it, it will increase knowledge for the benefit of both Buddhists, non-Buddhists, and others.